On behalf of Sayat Services, I'd like to welcome you all to the first in the series of Breakfast Conversations. This is for exploring and advancing your career, and it's open for middle schoolers and beyond. SciArt Services is a 501c3 nonprofit headquartered in uh, Middleton, Wisconsin, and uh, we are in the business of disseminating STEAM um, activities and services to K-12 and beyond to, in order to fill up gaps in uh, education at the school and uh, the college level. We're very happy to welcome Professor Krishnan Suresh uh, today. Krishnan Suresh is the Philip and Jean Myers Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm going to let him talk more about his, uh, his background and how he got here. Uh, so I won't steal the punch from that. But I've also sent in a short bio of his uh, to everybody in the group here, so you can read that also. Uh, we also would like to welcome Pranav Krishna Ramasubramanian who is a freshman at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He's majoring in systems engineering and uh, is also a student of uh, and a professional accompanying artist in the Mridangam, which is the uh, South Indian percussion drum. Uh, he has a lot of other interests too, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him here as the moderator. Welcome to all of you. And uh, we will be having this fortnightly session. So please stay tuned to the Sayat Services page on Facebook and uh, you will get more updates on, uh, on the upcoming talks as well. We have eminent people from different fields being part of this. So without further ado, welcome Professor Krishnan Suresh. He's also the founding director of SciArt Services, if I were to mention. Yep, there we go. Uh, thank you, Vanita. It's my pleasure to kickstart the series. I think it's a wonderful idea uh, for youngsters to know what's out there. Uh, as a pick and form their career. So I will, um, you know, probably share my screen now. And I would like this uh, whole thing to be interactive. So it's not a one way lecture by any means. So feel free to stop, ask questions at any time. Uh, I just threw in a set of slides uh, as a background and I'll walk you through what got me here and what I've learned in my life and uh, you know, and again, this is to repeat again. It's interactive, so feel free at any time. Just turn on an audio. I think there are like eight or ten people online, so it should be easy to just turn on the audio, ask a question, or send in a chat. I'll try to look up the chat as well. But audio will probably work out better. Okay. With that, uh, while most of my talk is about my career, uh, I would like to start with my family. Uh, it means a lot to me. So there we have it. Uh, Vanita is right there, my wife, and two sons. We have Sanjay, whom many of you already know. Um, he is in high school, uh, 11th grade, and Arjun, who is in sixth grade. Um, those are our two kids. And with that background, let, let me jump right in. I'll close this guy here. So what I'll do is I'll give you a timeline of how I got here because there are several uh, important lessons that I learned on the way, which I believe will help many of you. Um, and while this is supposed to be a, an intro to my research, I'll obviously not do any technical stuff, but I'll summarize some takeaway messages. So really, honestly, if I could look back in my career, what got me here first and foremost was a passion. I don't know how it happened, but I know it happened. Uh, many of you may already know this textbook. If you all done your 11th and did some physics, it's the famous Resnick and Halliday textbook. Um, that was so very famous even at that time when I was doing my 11th. That's back in 1984. Uh, that got me really started in the field of mechanics. Um, and that is the number one thing, which is passion. Um, the second thing I think is important for all of us to succeed is a conducive environment. Uh, and for me, it was IIT, and I call it mission IIT, almost a mission impossible. But fortunately, with the right friends, I was able to make it. And even at IIT, there is a lot to learn from everybody. It was just an amazing environment. And uh, by that, I mean, I don't mean that all of us need to go to MIT, Cornell. It's not that. It's all about the friends you keep, the people you mingle with, makes all the difference. They influence you uh, in many ways. So that's the environment part of it. Um, the other part, which I'll try to you know, go along is after I did my IIT in 1990, 
I joined UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and I would say that was kind of my first intro to real programming. It's an interesting switch from engineering physics to programming. And I got fascinated by that again, influenced a lot on what I was gonna do in the future. After completing my master's, I decided to switch to, uh, to Cornell for my PhD. Again, a wonderful environment, fantastic university. I cannot uh, talk enough about it. Um, and I put in there a determination because something that happened during my PhD uh, required me to take a different approach, a much stronger approach. My dad passed away towards, towards the end of my PhD, but it required obviously uh, you know, extensive support from my family, but some level of determination from my, from my end to finish it, finish the PhD. Um, that's another skill or another aspect that will kind of influence your career. I decided to work uh, in a company uh, for about a few years after my PhD. And that's when I started realizing that I do feel a sense of purpose in my life. Until then, it was just about, oh, I'm just going to do the next exam, do well, get my PhD. I didn't have uh, an idea exactly what am I passionate, really, what do I want to make a difference in this world, right? Um, so that's when I started realizing my passion was in education and research. Uh, that's where my heart was. Uh, and that took me to where I am today. I've been uh, enjoying my life as a faculty uh, here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from 2003 and uh, summarized my career as teaching and research. Okay, Hopefully you got a sense for where I got here and how I got here. Um, and I, you know, it's not meant to be a formula by any means, but if you want a recipe for a career, uh, hopefully a successful one, I would say these are the basic five elements that you need. You need a passion. You need to be something you're passionate about. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, mechanics or chemistry. It could be anything simple that you're really passionate about. And that'll tell you which way to go. And you need to create an environment for yourself that help you grow that skill. And you pick up the technical skills that you need to nurture it. You just cannot simply be passionate and say that I'm just passionate about something. If you're passionate about arts, if you don't practice it and don't develop the skills, it'll just remain a passion that'll die. And finally, you're going to face um, in a, 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 a lot of hurdles in your life. You know, every, everybody faces different types of hurdles. That's when your determination must kick in and stay focused. You, you will be pulled in every possible direction and you got to stay focused. And hopefully by then you'll have a purpose a purpose could be, I want to make a difference in this world, make it more green, um, you know, eco-friendly. I, I want to help the poor. I want to educate. Everybody has a purpose. And I'm sure, you know, if I talk to my friends, all of them have a deep, deep sense of purpose, what they want to achieve. So all these together, I think, will defend a career for you. It'll happen naturally. So you're all in different stages. Um, and in fact, I'd like to know more about you. Uh, what I'd like to do is... Um, I'd like you to state your name, uh, your school or college. I don't know if everybody's in college, some of you are in 11th, some of you are in first year college and so on. Uh, please tell us which school, what year you're in and something about your passion. Again, do not be shy about your passion. Passion is yours. That's what defines who you are. Okay, you never should have blo you know, be uh, you know, unhappy about any passion that you have or be shy about it. Um, and I think the next question I'd like to ask you to talk about is what skills do you think you will need to nurture that passion? Okay. Um, so I'll, I will let uh, others speak. So for a second, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I'd like to get the video on so you get to see everybody. Um, maybe let's run up to start off, kick off and say three things, right? Uh, four things, your name, college or year, what are you passionate about, right? And what skills do you think you'll need to uh, nurture that passion? And meanwhile, others can think about it. Again, just speak from your heart. You don't have to impress anybody. Turn up, go ahead. You may, may want to turn on. It'd be great if you guys who is talking to turn on the video as well. We can put a face to the name. Hi, everyone. My name is Pranav Krishna and I'm a Subramanian. And I just finished my first year at uh, BYUC. I'm a systems engineering and design major. 
And uh, I'm also minoring concurrently in computer science. So uh, my passion throughout like high school and like throughout middle school has been like robotics. That's all I've done as well as Carnatic music. Um, so I play the Murdangam, which is a South Indian Carnatic percussion and hand drum. Um, and then I also like did robotics. I like led many teams. Uh, uh, like we went to the world championships, we did all that. So that's what I wanted to stick on throughout my major in college. And that's where I chose my college as well. And I've always wanted to do the mixture between engineering dynamics, as well as also computer science, where you have the application of computer science in engineering. Um, I like that intersectionality. And that's what I really wanted to do uh, my major in. So the skills I definitely think I'll need are uh, much more in programming. I need to get much better at programming, learn some more uh, advanced structures, be able to also learn advanced engineering skills be able to use design optimization, which is very important, and be able to uh, learn different types of manufacturing and applications in industry as well. Oh, thank you, Pranav. That's a great intro. Uh, I'm just going to call out names in the order that I see on my screen. So if I could ask Sudarshan to turn on your audio and speak. Uh, OK, Uncle. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Sudarshan Prasanna. I'm uh, an eighth grader at Riverwatch Middle School in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I'd say my passion is uh, I, I, I love uh, singing and uh, playing Carnatic violin. Um, I say in my uh, the skills I need for that, I, I need to like you know, kind of like small term, but like um, improve my fingering, my bowing, make sure I can keep playing in like the vocal style of tradition. And then I don't know, just keep trying to persevere with it and get and make sure my voice is like, you know, not strained or something. and you know, just keep trying and singing and just growing the art. That's my goal right now. Awesome. Great. All the best for that. Uh, Atul? Um, hi, my name is Atul Shreyas Gonda. Um, I'm a student at the Academy of Aerospace and Engineering Middle School in Windsor, Connecticut. Um, and my passion is um, math and I think like the skills that I need for that is um is like getting better at uh at, at like using different formulas to solve problems and uh and like keep trying to learn more uh but like learn different things about math like different formulas and stuff. Good, very good. All the best for you. Uh, I'm going to ask Siddharth. Hi, my name is Siddharth. And I i don't really have a passion yet. I just really like math. Um, I would kind of want to do something in like engineering or maybe become a doctor or something. I'm not sure yet. Yeah, uh, just like something about like programming, computer software, or something along those lines. Or a doctor. Both are fine with me. Good. I mean, that's I good to have a wide variety. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I also play the mridangam too. Yeah, nice. No, it's it's perfectly okay to have multiple passions, right? And it eventually you'll start realizing and narrowing down as you go. So there's no need to rush. But great, have multiple passions. Great. Uh, Nishta. Hi, my name is Nishta Iyengar. I go to West Collierville Middle School. I'm a sixth grader, and it's in um, Collierville, Tennessee. I'm passionate about art and creating things, and I also like helping others. So um, I think some skills I'll have to um, develop are like um, more like sincerity towards any tasks, and also like um, like persevering and making sure I complete things on like the deadline, and also like um, well, there doesn't have to be a deadline, but like making sure I um, persevere and continue to the continue the task with my best effort. And then also, um, I also have to like develop certain skills in art um, and like, yeah. Nice. Yeah, wide variety of interests. That's pretty good. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Akshaya is ne next. Um, hello, I'm Akshaya and I'm going to seventh grade to Lexington Middle School in um, Cyprus. 
Um, my interest and passion is Carnatic music. I learn vocal and mandolin. Um, I take part in many uh, music events, and I think some skills I would need is to watch concerts and practice. Mm, that's wonderful. I don't know too many people learn mandolin. That's wonderful. Uh, Gopal, by the way, is my classmate. And I'm wondering if Gopal wants to say anything um, in addition to what we spoke about, Gopal. He does wonderful things back in India. Hello, Suresh. Hey, Everything is going well. I'm just watching the program. Please continue. OK, thank um, you, Gopal. I, yeah. um, Deepika is one of our uh, future speakers. And uh, Deepika, do you have anything to add? No, very interesting to see all these uh, kids and being so honest and about you know their passions and uh, their outlook. Um, wonderful to have these series and I'm learning more as I listen to you, Suresh. So hoping <laughs> to contribute uh, to no, this. No, thank you. No, Deepika is very, very accomplished and uh, we really, very, really, very fortunate to listen to her uh, maybe in a few weeks from now. So we'll wait for that. But we'll move on to the version. I'm sorry if I am not able to read. Deepika will be actually giving a talk on stem cell research, which is her area. So that's that's coming up very in a few weeks. Uh, person? I'm not hearing anything. Anita, can you use that turned off or? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just trying to ask that person to unmute. Meanwhile, I'm person... Uh, hello. Uh, oh, yeah, good. Is that a uh, parent or a child? I didn't know. Uh, no, I'm a child personally. Uh, I'm from class 12. My passion is in computer science and uh, creating programs and solving normal uh, day problems. I like reading story books. Uh, uh, I uh, don't know which field in computer science I have to enter, but I would like to uh, be in the field of computer science. I like chemistry, that's all. Wonderful. You said you were in school or college? I didn't quite catch that. Oh, no, I am in college. I'm in Goldstone. Okay. So I'm in Wonderful. school, Goldstone. Okay. Wonderful. Ananya? Is that the parent? Is that the parent? No, it's okay. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Ananya. I am in 10th grade at Independence High School in Frisco, Texas. I like to sing and dance. I learn Carnatic music and I also do choir, which if you like know, it's like very different types of music. Like usually people don't do them together because like they say it might like like not help the other one, but like I, I love doing both of them. So I'm just trying to make an effort and I think it's going pretty good, but I would say I still need to like work on like opening up my voice a little bit more and like singing a little louder and for dance definitely like i haven't danced in a while because it's like covid but i would say i would say just like practice more wonderful you know managing carnatic music and car is challenging for sure they come with completely different requirements but that's really pushing your capabilities to the next level uh did i miss anybody I don't think that's what shows up on my screen. That's great. So I just want to, you know, say that uh, you know, it's good, good to see a wide variety of, you know, students with different background and passion. Uh, keep that going, nurture it, develop the skills. And I'll try to move on to something about a little deeper into what I do. Uh, so you get a glimpse of what a faculty life looks like, right? That's part of what I'm supposed to do. So I tried to create a pie chart and I want you to guess, some, anybody can turn on. So I have four blocks, right? One of the biggest block, the next biggest block. Uh, now, what do you think as a faculty, the biggest block of my time is spent on? Anybody? Are you doing a screen share, Suresh? Oh, I thought I did. Maybe, You're not. sorry. Sorry about that. Switching to share screen, I apologize. Uh, slideshow from current slideshow. Give me one second while I... As you can see, no. well, the cat is on the back. If you got a glimpse of my slide, <laughs> but if you didn't see it, uh, what do you think? Or even if it's what is the biggest 
piece of the pie, if this is my time spent at work, what do you think I spend most of my time on as a faculty? A teaching and mentoring. Uh, it's a very good one. Now, I'd like to separate out mentoring from teaching. Um, pretty close. Anybody wants to add any other words to that? Um, maybe communicating with colleagues. Yeah, that's definitely part of my life. What else do you think? What else do you think I do? Curriculum creation and preparation. Yeah, a lot of good things you guys are mentioning, right? So I like to put this into uh, four categories, which I think will make sense to you when you see it. The number one thing most researchers, most faculty members spend their life on is on research. Uh, and I'll give you a glimpse of what research is all about. And by research, we mean multiple things. The first and foremost is uh, student training that you'll all at some point maybe do a master's or a PhD. Those are called, and uh, those fall under the graduate students and graduate student training is the first and foremost task that faculty are in charge of. And that typically leads to what's called publications where uh, we disseminate our knowledge. And that's again, part of our responsibility. And you'll see an example of a proposal and what that all means. So that's the first and foremost task. Next thing that we do is teaching. So I'm trying to separate out research from teaching. Teaching does take uh, quite a bit of time. Um, and I teach both graduate level, which is masters and PhD courses and undergraduate courses. Um, and then the next task is something that somebody mentioned, spending time with my colleagues, uh, going over what's our plan for the next year, admissions, right? Many of you apply to schools. Guess who decides who gets in or not? It's us, faculty. So uh, we spend a lot of time going through admission policy, hiring, who should be our next faculty member, whom should we go after? Right, that's our hiring plan. And outreach, outreach is something that I'm passionate about as well, which is youngsters like you, right? It's not required to do it, but outreach is something that I enjoy where we try to educate youngsters on various topics, uh, go visit middle school, high schools, give lectures, or do some service like this through SciArt where we spend time talking about something that could be useful to you. So that's kind of the background of how we spend our time. And I always like to acknowledge um, my students because pretty much everything that we do here as faculty, it's just impossible without the help of graduate students. Our life revolves around graduate students as faculty and I consider them two family. I have a family at home and I have a family at work, right? Um, and uh, I have about four PhD students, two more are joining shortly and about 10 graduated PhDs. So roughly I would say, you know, past the second year of my tenure, or my stay at UW, but one PhD student a year is roughly what a you know, typical faculty member uh, graduates. Uh, those are my, uh, that's my family at work. The next thing I wanna get into is get a glimpse. Now you're interested in what exactly do I do? Can I summarize that in some simple words so that all of us can understand? And obviously, you know, we don't wanna go into the depth of what I do, but how does it translate to, how does it even make a difference to a common man, right? At the end of the day, we wanna make sure what we do as faculty has value outside. So I'm gonna give a very simple example here. Uh, you know, this is a shelf, right? And you have the bookshelf support, uh, which I've kind of modeled it like that, that you see in the top. You wanna to make it as light as possible because, you know, that'll reduce the amount of material you use and lighter, the better. So it's a very simple, design problem. So in the world of where I live in professionally is the design part of it. Now, how do design engineers typically start reducing weight? They rely a lot on computers today. They'll do what is called computer analysis. So they apply the expected load. I put 10 books here. Each of these support will see the weight of five books, something like that. And then you add a little bit of safety factor and figure out the load on each of these supports and do computer analysis the computers will tell you where the load is. Green means there's a lot of load here. Blue means there's not much going on. Using that, they do a trial and error process where they say, oh, maybe I can remove material at that corner. Maybe I can remove material there and so on and so forth, right? So that's kind of the typical design process that engineers today, whether you go to Boeing, go to Ford, go to any company, this is the, roughly the process they go through. But any of you can, uh, you know, you can imagine this quickly goes out of hand because it's limited by the designer's creativity. Somebody else might come up with a different design. How do you know they're right? Who's right? How do you know we get the best design, right? 
So this is the kind of question that really intrigued me when I was working um, in the company that I mentioned. And that's what made me think about, I want to pursue this as a research problem. Fundamentally, what is the design process? I'll give you one more example. I work with the uh, Formula SA team at uh, Wisconsin Madison. They're a great team. They do real good engineering um, and they have exactly the same problem. They have some parts in the, in the uh, automotive design and they want to get rid of the weight. They want to minimize the weight subject to a lot of loads, right? You can imagine the car going through acceleration, braking, it goes through a lot of um, force, subject to a lot of force. So what do they do? They go through exactly the same process. They use computer analysis. Somebody sits in, on the computer for you know, even a couple of weeks and goes through the trial and error process. Okay. Now I'll just pause for a second here and ask if there are any questions about what I'm trying to convey. So far, I've just not told you anything about my research. I've only told you what goes on, what I'm puzzled by, what I'm interested in solving. Anybody has any questions? So, um, yep. so for like the previous slide where you said almost try and minimize weight, does that like, so there actually minimize like the actual like on the object? Yeah. Yep. Uh, this is yep. That object has. Yep. Uh, Gopal, I think there's some background noise from your end. Would it be okay if you could turn off? Yeah. Th thank you. Um, sorry, I heard that as uh, minimize weight the same as minimize mass. Is that your question? Like so, uh, like uh, I asked. So, like um, the you're like so you said that you're trying to minimize the like, the load on the car. So that's not like the actual like, you know weight or not weight, like the mass of the object, but like the load or resistance that it has on the ability of the automobile to, you know, function, right? It's all related. So by minimize, you obviously have want to have maximum performance of the car, right? You want to accelerate as quickly as possible and lower the weight of each component, the faster you can go. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're saying, hey, look, I don't want to break any parts, but I want to beat the next team I want to accelerate as quickly as possible. And one of the smart ways to do that is get rid of any additional weight uh, that is the car is carrying around. And that happens to be one of the design. They, do, they have to do this for every part in the, comp in the car. And this is what every car company does. Does it make sense? Yeah, they're, so like they're trying to reduce the resistance on the car. Uh, they're not trying to res uh, reduce the resistance from the car. They're trying to reduce the weight of the car. The car body shape is what controls the resistance. That's a different problem. This is simply the weight of the car. That's some component that's deep inside under the hood that carries the weight that, uh, that you know, adds to the weight. They're trying to reduce the weight to the part. Resistance is more like the air resistance, which controls controlled by the shape of the uh, hood and so on and so forth. Uh, okay. it, it could it also, it, it just means minimizing the material that you use to make the car, right, Suresh? Yeah, it, it also influences the amount of material used, therefore the cost of the car as well. So oh. like in a slightly simpler way, uh, if you know Newton's first law, like force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? So there is also inertia that you're trying to like reduce basically. It, from, exactly. Like, kind of point of view. Exactly, exactly. See, where my, see the thing is that that's a very good answer. Uh, if you go into mechanics, force is mass into acceleration, lower the mass, the force is fixed in some sense because that's how much the engine can produce you are given certain engine that you are to use. So you want to maximize the acceleration, you reduce the mass. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you for uh, who are, uh, I, I was not able to see the screen, but thanks very much for jumping in. So anyway. This is Pranav Suresh. Oh, thank you Pranav, sorry, I couldn't see the screen. Thank you Pranav. Okay, it's all good. Yeah, uh, feel free, anybody can jump in to answer the question, to ask more questions. So this is what led me to think about the research question that I'm gonna pose, which is, is there a more systematic approach to design? Is it all come down to trial and error that somebody does it one way and I do it differently? Is that something called the best design? Is there any way to automate it? That'll reduce the headache a lot because then I don't have to you know, trust somebody's expertise or take two weeks to do it, right? That is the goal of our uh, research that in a post my research group almost 12 to 12 years ago, uh, that got us to where we are today. 
So this is how the research problem, that's one of the problems. There are many such problems. I'm just uh, summarizing exactly what happens in research is you start with a problem and I'm just posing it as a figure. That's a research problem. Then we have an idea. Okay, you need an idea. Now I'll talk about the idea that I'm gonna you know, be used in a minute. Uh, Vanita, how am I doing on time? Um, okay, I think another 15 minutes. Um, yeah, and we should let Pranav ask uh, some leading questions too. Sure, uh, Pranav, uh, like we spoke in the morning, feel free to jump in and I'll, I, I will interpret every two slides for Pranav to jump in as well. So the idea part of it is something that I will uh, talk about in a second. And then this, is, this will lead to what is called a proposal where we write to national agencies, NSF, many of you may know NSF is North South Foundation, but in this case it's National Science Foundation, um, where we ask for funding to carry out the research. These days, research cannot happen without money. We need funding to support the graduate students. It's not like it's 1600 where I, you know, all the physicists used to sit in a corner of the room and just do research. Today, we depend on large infrastructures to get research done. And that leads to research, which is really the graduate students who are producing the work, getting trained, creating workforce, maybe creating products, leading to companies. So that's a research product, pro, uh, process that I want you to get an uh, insight into. So to understand what a faculty does, is exactly this, right? They go from a problem to completing the research. And sometimes the same process is also carried out in companies, okay? Um, I'm gonna jump into the idea of what, how to go about reducing weight. But before I do that, uh, any questions? And again, Pranav, feel free to jump in and add your comments or lead some questions if, if you have any. Sure. Uh, so thinking about this, do you think that additive manufacturing has a benefit towards the specific like optimizational problem than uh, productive manufacturing? Uh, very, very good question. I'll, unfortunately, I didn't have slides. That's one of the areas that I work in is in additive manufacturing. So we take some of this design and get it additively manufactured. That's a manufacturing aspect of the problem, not so much the design aspect of the problem. But uh, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, I don't have, may not have the slides here to really talk about it, but many of the things that we do in design today are additively manufactured or 3D printing. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So the idea that we had was very simple. I'll give you a design problem. And here's the simple thing about it. None of you have a background in, you know, you've not done a PhD, you're still in eighth grade, 12th grade, first year grad. But many of you can answer this question right away, I think. So I'm gonna give you this problem. Uh, you know, a simple design problem. So you imagine the bookshelf is fixed to the left side, you're putting a load at the right, hopefully it's very clear. And the part is gonna bend like this, right? On the right side, you see that. I'm gonna ask you a very simple question. I'm going to let you remove material like this or like that. Where do you think will, which one would you prefer? Would you prefer A or would you prefer B? Anybody who wants to jump in? Would you do B so you can balance the, um, act like the, uh, I don't know what this was. Would it be like the weight will be balanced on both sides? Uh, a is also balanced. A is also balanced. A, you're removing at both ends. B is also removing at both ends. Uh, a. Go ahead, somebody. Uh, uh, yes, you said A. Okay. Now, why do you think it's A? Uh, because uh, when you look at moment of inertia, it is far away from our body. It will produce more torque and lead to an imbalance. You guys are all on the right track. The key is to understand that this corner here, you can imagine that what I'm showing in red, faces a lot of load. It's being stressed. And that is the part that you want to keep. Whereas uh, this corner here, right hand top corner is light blue. And you can see that that part of the material is not really helpful. So you would not do this, instead you would do this. That's what an engineer, by the time you're done with your undergrad in engineering, you'll know that A is a way to go, not B. And all we did was, how do we convert this into math? What is the intuition behind it? I'm going to skip the slide because it has the only set of math equations for this set of slides is we do a math part of it. We convert that into formal mathematics and we separating numbers. And the number says that if you put a hole here, the price you're gonna pay for its performance is really small. Whereas if you put a hole at B, the price you're gonna pay is very large. 
So I'm skipping this part of it, but I just want to uh, tell you that you can take an idea and convert it into formal mathematics, which just takes all the training that you go through in master's, PhD, and so on and so forth. And we took this idea and we converted that into a set of methods. And we started thinking, hey, if you can start removing material from the bottom up, I'll start removing material from this corner. And then I'll start removing material near the wall. I know I'm skipping a lot of things here, but I want to get you an image of how we start removing material using computers, right? This is not a human now. The computer starts removing material for you automatically. And we convert that into code. And obviously I want to make the connection to the training that I had is in programming without which we couldn't have written this code, right? You need to understand that have the skills to convert what we have into a piece of code. We convert that code, we run the code, and now I can solve this problem and say, I have this design problem. How do I create a lightweight part? Here's a short movie about it. That's a computer generating a beautiful looking design that is 50% the weight of the original design and can do the job, okay? And we believe in our software so much that I give anybody um, $100 if they can beat this design, right? So that's the beauty of the math is it can beat any design engineer. So I'll show you an example in a minute. Uh, with that, you can now compare how did we do against what the students did uh, in their you know, trial and error method. They came up with this design. What did we do? We wrote the software for it. It took us many years to write the software, but to run the software and get new designs take less than three, four minutes to do. And the computer said, this is a better looking, better performing design. And we told the undergrad team, don't do this, do this. Don't put the support here, make it go down and so on and so forth. And you can see the impact it will have on their life, right? So they don't spend weeks doing this anymore. They take our software, run it, they get ideas and off they go, okay? So that's the kind of thought process that goes into research and you can start generating really beautiful designs. These are all computer generated designs. Um, for example, we put a disc here and many of you may not understand this picture, but intuitively you're taking a ring and twisting it. When it twists it, the computer says, this is the best design I can produce for you. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's a, actually a computer generated design that's so pretty, right? And you can start doing wonderful things like this. For example, we can ask the computer, go ahead and design a bridge for me in the space. The loading of the bridge is like this. Uh, it's, you know, imagine this bridge to be, uh, somebody's asking questions. Uh, I, will, I will answer the question on time. Uh, feel free to ask me a question. I'll pause after this slide here. But the, uh, the computer, interestingly, came up with this beautiful looking bridge, right? That was completely, completely computer generated. And if you start looking at Google for images of bridge, here it is, right? Can you believe that? That the civil engineers developed this over years of development, whereas our software can now do this within minutes and it tells you that we've kind of understood the design process, okay? I'll stop here for a minute and uh, we still have time to, for questions. So I'd like to, uh, you know, open up the floor uh, for questions. For now, you can kick in to start off or anybody else can jump in. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so what is your opinion about uh, Autodesk Fusion 360 and its re recent like cloud-based uh, machine learning uh, like op to topological optimization just as uh, Pareto does? Okay. Oh, excellent. <laughs> you you're, you're hit the nail on the head. So this particular software was created by us many years ago and uh, Autodesk created something similar. In fact, Autodesk contacted me about seven years ago because they were so fascinated by our research, they wanted to take our software and use that as part of Autodesk. Um, and so they worked with me, but because of some university restrictions, they could not use the software that we had developed directly. There are all kinds of restrictions on the use of software uh, that the university imposes, but that gives you an idea that this is exactly the kind of idea that Autodesk implemented in their software, okay? So they actually uh, gave our group a big check to do further research in this field. 
because they're just so fascinated by this work. I hope I answered that. Yeah, wow. Because uh, our curriculum actually had a little bit of the same exact optimization for um, like a part of our CAD class last semester. And we were using a very similar uh, uh, like bike frame that had the same exact uh, the the wheel, the axle assembly as shown in the, the picture. And Got it. Uh, no, that's that's wonderful because our software is also being used by a lot of universities, including University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, mm -hmm. and it's part of SolidWorks. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So we are we are in sync with the other companies that produce similar software. But I work from a research group. That's, a that's excellent question. Excellent observation. Anybody else? Um, Uncle, you put like a, you were talking about like. Sorry, um, they're, they're, like a computer generated optimization about like, which one would create the least error versus the other, which one would have the like, least impact or the most like um, risk free uh, like optimization. So when you design something, should you go with the mindset of how can we make the least error or should we go, how can we make the best product that we can? Okay. I think you're well suited to start as a faculty researcher because you're asking good questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there is always a balance between a lot of things, including risks and like, likelihood of failure and performance. Now that's a different field called reliable, reliability-based engineering, where we don't try to maximize the performance, but, but we try to minimize the risks involved. Uh, that's another field we work in, but I'm not touching upon that right now. But the wonderful question about risk in design uncertainty, manufacturing errors, there are a lot of things going on. So what you see here is really the tip of the iceberg. There's so many things uh, that also goes on behind the scene. So I'm not answering your question directly, but I'm just saying that those are really valid questions and you should nurture those questions. And hopefully one day you get to see all the ideas that come in, the math behind uncertainty, probability of failure and so on and so forth. And also, is it possible to just get a career in analyzing the risk and like the optimization in like design? Absolutely. So there is uh, undergraduate, uh, for example, we do an, it doesn't matter, you can do an undergraduate in engineering, civil engineering, mechanical, chemical. And then in masters, uh, mm -hmm. you can start leaning towards statistics and stochastic processes. These are very specific subfields where they talk about uncertainty. Um, and uncertainty is an extremely important field because uh, you can never eliminate failure, right? You just cannot. You can only minimize the right likelihood of failure. So uh, therefore, you know, researchers who are understand this quantification of uncertainty are really, really important in the industry. So uh, somebody who knows the math behind quantifying this uncertainty are extremely important. So to answer your question, yes, you can certainly specialize in these fields. And uh, just one last question. So. Sure. So like on this slide, there's like a picture of like the computer generated like um, a bridge and then like the actual bridge, which took them like a lot, a lot longer to build. Right. So if you were to implement this like design for a bridge, if like you got the like the go ahead to like implement this in like an actual like city structure and stuff, or like you have to actually. Uh, uh, good question. Now there's a lot more to go into the civil, the real design versus the design we generated because we didn't take into account a lot of different things, including uh, the manufacturing, the limitations of building concrete uh, structures. So to convert it into practice, there's many more steps to be taken. Uh, we, we do manufacture a lot of these parts today. Uh, companies like uh, Harley Davidson uh, actually uses our software uh, to make parts and put it on test beds, right? So they, they, but there are a few more steps to cover before we can call it real products. And like, how does it go from like, um... Like, uh, like you're like you're like the by the research you mean it's like you know using this computer generated thing to like design things that can be like implemented in the real world. How does it go from like the computer screen to like actually being used in the real world? Wonderful. So the way it does is that although it's what you see on screen, it's not just an image; it's an actual what is called a representation of the geometry. For example, right here is a representation of geometry, uh, where you get to see the design. Now this design can be at a push of a button, can be, for example, a 3D printed or sent to a CNC machine or a milling machine where the computer there understands that how to remove material. So that this next step of automating the manufacturing process. Uh, that again is a research field by itself. I, I've dealt, dealt with it a little bit, 
but it's separate field by itself where we convert this design in the model into machine instructions for a machine to manufacture it. Okay. So, so, like, sorry, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um. So, like, how could you like get a job that like so? Would companies just hire you based on your ability to like come up with like this like the I, like the design process you mentioned? Like, you have a problem, then an idea, and you just specialize in making the idea and like getting the grant and then going ahead with the computer design. Or would you have to take your career further to actually like get a job in implementing this in the real world? Or is it strictly limited to actually like specializing? <laughs> Very good question. Very good question. So you guys are asking excellent question. I think I don't mind having this conversation for another couple of hours because you guys are asking really good question. This particular uh, process that I showed you is very specific for a faculty and or a researcher at an organization. For example, uh, Deepika Rajesh, who is going to be speaking in a few minutes, may also fall into this category because she follows a very similar process. However, uh, an engineer who doesn't need to go about looking for funding, they will simply go take a product that we produce and start applying them. So they don't have to go through this whole process of developing ideas and so on. They just take the final product and apply it in a context. So that's a different set of jobs, and that would be an application engineer. So this particular whole process is very specific to either a faculty or a researchers from industry. Does that make sense? And like, yeah, and like this like job can like go like further, like it's like a chain react. It's like, is it like a chain reaction where like once you actually make the product, there's like people to market it. And then there's like, you know, yep. that advertising. So this is like a, it just like goes on, right? Yep. And I'll talk about the end. For example, I'll give you an example of where, where does it go beyond this, right? The chain beyond this, I'll talk about that in a minute. Suresh, I think you should give the kids a little bit of a, a small glimpse about, you know, intellectual property, because even if a industry wants to take that and take it to the next step, you're just yep. not inventing and just keeping it in a book somewhere. Yep. That's an immense you. value in that. Thank you, Deepika. I have one slide on that at the end. I will definitely talk about that. So anything else? I have one question. Yep. Um, does the program take into account like materials and like its usage, like heat expansion and all that stuff? Yep. Factor? So we, we, we worry about how is it going to be used with an aircraft, a part that goes into aircraft. We talk about the engine temperature and how it can expand. So we take into account the actual application of the part in, in the in situ. So we do take into thermal expansions and other magnetic effects and so on and so forth. And uh, there are specialized softwares like ANSYS that will help you model that, right, Suresh? That's right. So, uh, you know, in fact, Pranav mentioned Autodesk, there's ANSYS, there's SolidWorks, there are companies that specialize in each of this, and they use some of the products coming from the university as a foundation. In fact, Autodesk, just as I mentioned again, bringing back to Autodesk, Autodesk the original software was developed on top of the software developed by my advisor at Cornell. So we go back a long way. The whole Autodesk company itself is based on the foundation of a product called Paddle developed at Cornell in 1986, 87. So everything is churning out from research. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we're coming close to 11 o'clock. So let me finish, wrap up in two slides more. So I want to tell you how did we do against the real world? Uh, let me wrap up these uh, two slides and then I will take more questions. So here's an example of a real challenging problem posed by G uh, General Electric. They said, guys, we'll give you this design, try and remove as much material as possible, uh, but there's so many different loads, right? And they gave us, you know, they gave the whole community, they opened it to the world. And we had about 640 entries to this design competition. As you can see, different types of designs were proposed and to come up with an optimal design, lightweight design. And many of them used trial and error. Suresh, can you go back to the previous slide? It was too quick. Yeah, I'm not I sure am people processed it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I was hoping that we'll be in time. Otherwise, you go past 11 o'clock, it shouldn't be a problem. That's okay. I think it's important to get this. Yeah, now this is a design competition. So to explain again, what General Electric did was they said they gave a sample design. This is what called the design space. You want to remove material from this design. This is the original design. And they gave different types of loads, not just one load. One is a vertical load, one is a slanted load, horizontal load, a torque. 
they said the part can be subject to one or more of these loads. You guys figure out where to remove material so that this part shown in orange can be as light as possible. And they said, we're gonna give you $1,000 for the top 10 entries. And then if you make it to the next level, there's a $20,000 price. So because there's no perfect designs, they knew that it's gonna be a trial and error process and it's not very obvious at all how to remove material given so many different load conditions. Hopefully that part of it is clear. And this was uh, proposed, I think in 2014, I think I'm not sure of the exact date. This is the result of the challenge. They opened the challenge for about three months. After about three months, they had about 600 odd entries from all over the world. Um, and these are engineering companies. We're talking about you know, hundreds of companies all around the world saying, hey, here is our design. We could hit this many grams. We came in even lighter and so on and so forth. And they had lots of comments from which you can gather how they went about doing it. Most of the companies use trial and error and there are at least two to three design members sitting on Fridays. Companies said, oh, take Friday afternoons off because if you win this, you get a lot of fame to the company because we got the best design. So they were dedicated time, time spent. And you can see this from different comments on this website. The, the website is still on. All you have to do is search for the keyword GE GrabCAD design competition. That, that website is still there, if I remember correctly. And then, you know, many companies were able to remove 72% of the mass. So in, in other words, you started with the whole weight of one kilogram. Uh, you know, they were able to bring it down to, you know, 72% of the weight was removed during the design process. But they were looking, you know, working in teams and they said, oh, we're still working on it. We're looking for creative solutions. You can see how difficult this problem is. That's what I want to convey through these two slides to tell you that this problem is as recent as a few years ago where we still, you know, design teams are still struggling with this problem. How do you come up with good designs, right? And you need engineers time and money spent on it. What did we do? We had one undergraduate student who used our software and the undergraduate student spent two days to understand the problem of what this problem is. And all it took that student was eight minutes to set it up and solve. No trial and error, nothing. And you can see the design, uh, the final design being proposed by our software, right? And we pretty much hit the nail. We got 70% reduction, which was very close to that 72% that the best companies have spent weeks trying to do, right? And here is one undergrad student who has basics in mechanical engineering, was able to use a software and get this design, right? So all of you are probably wondering, so did we win the prize, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we were about three years late, right? So this is already over and we created the software in 2016, 17. So we want to take the whole design, the previous design and try our software to see how well we do. And we did extremely well. And yes, we did not win the competition, but put the competition today, we'll probably win, okay? And it's almost like, uh, I give the an analogy between this design software uh, with the chess software. The analogy is very simple, right? Humans create, chess software, and then they let it go. The chess software comes back and beats the humans, right? You start wondering, how did that happen? It exactly happens in design too, that humans, us, we created the uh, software for doing design. It comes back and beats us on the design software. How did it do it? Number crunching, supercomputers. It can crunch numbers like crazy that humans cannot, right? So that is the, what we exploit and tells you that there's so much of beauty there that we can combine with our skills and uh, understanding the math and software and so on and so forth, okay? And I don't have a whole lot more saying we're doing all kinds of cool things with not just with one material, with multiple materials where we can use different alloys and different parts of the design. You may not know what an alloy is, it's fine. Like think about it as steel, copper, aluminum in different parts of the design uh, to get good shapes, good designs that you can 3D print. Um, Sorry to interrupt uh, Suresh, but yeah. since there are a lot of kids here who are also interested in music, I remember you had a student who won a design competition long ago for developing yeah. a, a mouthpiece for a saxophone, right? 
That is right. So <laughs> that's an, I had forgotten that. So there was an undergrad student who was uh, obviously very passionate about saxophone. He was also passionate about engineering. And uh, so we came up with this idea, how do you design a mouthpiece that is 3D printable? That the mouthpiece is a very critical part of the saxophone, uh, as you all know. And most of the mouthpieces are made handcrafted, very expensive. And he wanted to come up with an automated method for uh, designing this mouthpiece. And we worked together in acoustics and used software for acoustic analysis to come up with a design. And he won the competition at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for the best technology application to music. So think about that, you're applying all the way from you know, your engineering skills to music to anything you want. So the world is out there to explore. Okay? And thanks for bringing that up, I'd forgotten about it. And multiphysics, somebody asked about heat, thermal, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into the detail because it's a little bit sophisticated unless you have a background in engineering. I just want to say that we take into account you know, thermal expansion and so on and so forth. Last but not the least, Deepika mentioned about intellectual property, right? So the question is, all right, we created this wonderful software. What am I going to do with it? I asked a few companies, hey, do you want the software? They said, no, we will not touch it because it belongs to your lab. I, unless you form a company and you transfer the technology through proper channels, you cannot touch the software. So that's one of the things that we had to handle. And what did we do was we went through an organization called WARF. Every university has a similar organization. WARF, uh, Science of Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, all they do is they take the ideas developed in the research labs and they create the intellectual property around that uh, knowledge and sell it to companies. They say, now we're protecting you from the lab. You're not you know, violating anything now. That's why I'm also separated out. I don't want to be involved in the company discussion because I'll have conflict of interest and so on and so forth. And so interestingly, it happened that we ourselves started a company because there was so much of demand for the software at that point that we started a company. My, uh, one of my students, graduate student Praveen Yadav, he graduated and he said, hey, I'm so excited about this work. I want to start a company. So we created this company and that company started producing software that was bought, that software was bought by a lot of companies, um, sold a lot of licenses. So that's kind of the background that it did not die in the lab. It found a way out of the lab and resulted in a company. I did not plan that way, but it's a wonderful experience to see it go from a research idea problem all the way to companies that can you know, employ people and start you know, providing job opportunities. So I think that pretty much completes my chat. I think I ran a little bit over. Uh, I'll stop here. I'm sorry if we didn't give enough time for questions. I was afraid of running over time, but please feel free to ask more questions now. Uh, because, you know, I, have, I have time. Can you stop your screen share, Suresh? So the I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Uh, professor, I had a quick question. So what do you think about the way that engineering is taught today? And how do you think it should change in the next decade or two? And if you think that uh, engineering teaching would be better off with a change, how are you implementing it in your classroom today? Wow, that's a fully loaded question. <laughs> Wonderful question. There are different dimensions to it. Is how do we teach it? Are we teaching the right things? Are we adopting to the environment? So one of the things that's happening obviously is because of the pandemic, right? A lot of, comp lot of comp universities are teaching it online. Should we continue to do that? Because it definitely opened up the possibility that maybe we should be teaching as much online as possible. That way you're you know, it's getting more efficient. And that's something our university is already implementing now. It gives options for people from Northern part of Wisconsin to log in instead of getting their dorms in, on campus. There are obviously advantages to being on campus and so on. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect, which is more, how should we be teaching uh, engineering or any field that matter, in particular engineering, I would say a major change, which you're already feeling for now, I think is the fact that engineering is multidisciplinary, meaning that you know, we used to have, oh, chemical engineering. I don't know what you're talking about in mechanical. Oh, electrical is different. Civil is different. We don't talk to each other, right? That was 20 years ago. Today we talk about engineering and tomorrow we talk about, I'll come to you at all. Thanks for, I got here and I'll come and ask, I'll let you speak for a minute. Give me a second here. Um, 
So that's another major change and systems engineering, which you're pursuing, pursuing for now is exactly that. Is a, they said, well, we need to create a systems people who know different fields and that's a major change that's not gonna go away. Okay, there are so many different aspects. I'll stop there by saying there's the two things, online and systems level education are the two major changes that are gonna happen. Uh, Atul, go ahead. Turn on your microphone. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so last year, um, last year, me and a friend of mine did a science fair project for school where, um, where we used like homemade electromagnets to, um, to, to produce electricity. And we use like different sized PVC pipes and um, like various gauges of, uh, um, of magnetic wire to, um, to, and then like we combine different combinations of that to, um, to, and to, to put a magnet like in and out of it at like at certain speeds and yeah, then, understand. yeah, and then, do, and then doing that, we were trying to find out how much electricity we would um we would produce from that. Yeah, wonderful. So you had a specific question for me, or do you want me to come in? Oh, no, I just wanted to say that. No, that's wonderful. I think one of the things that we miss often in science is the hands-on experience. While it's good to be experts in reading books and understanding from books, it's extremely important in science and engineering to have that hands-on experience because you need to feel things, you need to know things through tangible methods. Right, that's what I'd like to emphasize that. So good job at all. However simple it is, that hands-on experience, nothing can replace that, which goes back to the problem that we have with uh, this uh, you know, long distance learning or virtual learning is just simply the lack of hands-on experience. You cannot replace that, right? So that must continue to happen. Any other question? Uncle? Yeah, go ahead. How do you think that using like um, a CAD it's to like it's like so efficient and like time saving and money saving and it like just like starts a chain reaction. How do you think that that will help in, impact the like, infrastructure and like the global like scale of you know like engineering and in general just daily life in general like even the next like century overall? How do you think the world will change? Right. Unfortunately, I'm not that knowledgeable to predict what's happening in the next century, but I can tell you that the impact of computers and CAD and so on. You know, we've seen it last 20 years, if anything, it's growing enormously because of uh, technologies like 3D printing and additive manufacturing, which are making our design even more uh, impactful. Uh, there are other challenges that are coming that we must address in cybersecurity, which is if you automate everything, all it takes is a hack and you messed up the whole process from design to manufacturing. So in fact, the problem with the oil pipeline we had two days ago, uh, is a hacking problem. So we are constantly facing dangers uh, that are gonna come in the way of technology. Uh, so these are things that are going to constantly reshape. I would say, you know, the good news really is nothing changes as far as what you guys need to do. Nothing changes. You gotta follow your passion. You gotta develop your skills. You gotta be determined. You gotta develop the right environment, right? So. That's, you know, it's a simple thing. Oh, should I change your plan? Oh, everything's changing. Good news, nothing changes, right? That's the best thing about all of these principles is that I don't care what's gonna to come tomorrow. I don't even want to know what's gonna to come tomorrow. I'll be ready for it because you develop the fundamental skills. So if I were your level or your age, I would say, don't worry about anything. Focus on your skills, focus on your passion, be determined in what you do. You will face those problems as they come. You don't need to be prepared for it today. Um, I'd like to add a comment to that. So uh, sure, please. based off of like, with just like looking at additive manufacturing, like for example, there's so many different applications and uh, like 3D metal printing as well that's existing now as a result of the same design optimization that Professor uh, Suresh has been doing. And it's um, kind of crazy because like, for example, if you have like a metal structure that needs to have cooling, for example, Mm -hmm. uh, you can actually build this structure that allows coolant to go right through the middle of the, the metal instead of having coolant around the system. For example, air spike engines are uh, like a pretty like uh, used common example now. And you have the, the propellant going through the middle of the engine. At the same time, you can actually have coolant uh, instead of having uh, a, a separate coolant uh, system going around the, the engine, you could just have it go right through the middle of it. And that's like 
an advancement in like an aerospace technology that allows for um, a very large application. And um, that's just a small example of how that works. So you have like a lot more creative designs for manufacturing that nobody really thought you could be doing before. So yep, that's very good point. I did not get a chance to talk about metal 3D printing a whole lot, but we do quite a bit of that in our group. Very good. Anything else? Like how, so when you like 3D print something, how does that like, are, are, so how does like the system, does the system have any limitations as to what it can do in terms of if you wanted to like mirror like a fence or like even like an airplane from something like small to a book, bookshelf to like a skyscraper, how, does like the um, CAD software have any limitations as to what it can do? The manufacturing machines have limitations. The CAD software usually do not have much limitation. They can design almost anything for you. But um, manufacturing wise, you might limit, you're limited by the space the machine can build within. Uh, most metal printing are in the size of say 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. That's the normal. However, there are what are called big area manufacturing. For example, Oak Ridge National Labs, they build, they've 3D printed a car, right? I mean, I visited them, I could actually sit in the car. So they 3D printed a, a polymer jet uh, based car. So there are technologies that can take you to large scale, but typical scales are something that you can hold in your hand. Uh, that's very typical size that you can build today. But you can always assemble parts to make it bigger. And between like having a job is actually like conceptualizing and printing the thing. Is there like, how does like that, how does that go from like the 3D printing to like actually being the skyscraper? Like, is there anyone to like modify it slightly? So it can be like ready to actually be built by civil engineers and like implemented in the real world. Uh, that is the 3D printing part, 3D printed parts are not exactly ready to be put on a part and fly with it. So there are going to be engineer application engineers who have to post process it, modify it, add some components to it. So most 3D printed parts are not immediately ready for application. They need some post process, for example, smoothening, polishing, cleaning up, and all that process. There are people who specialize in that. So like there is a difference between like just like dilating it and just you know like make, building it then and like actually like modifying it and tinkering with it. Yeah. Yeah. That. There is some. Yeah. There is some. There is a little bit of a gap there, but the gap is narrowing down. Also, the current processes we use for like for example metal three D printing isn't necessarily the best for um, like the actual structure itself has lots of like flaws that we're still like trying to figure out in the current like material science aspect of like engineering research right now. Okay, thank you. All right, any last few questions? Uh, Vanita, do you want to go? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Nishita. So uh, uh, I have one question. So from my understanding with adv advancement of technology to be able to create like these ideal plants with like very increasing efficiency, how do you think the concept of creativity in engineering will change over time? <laughs> so that's kind of uh, what I allude to in some of the designs that I was showing. For example, the uh, idea of creating a creative bridge, right? We think we thought it's creative, but uh, the computer said, no, I can automate it. There's an algorithm for that. Uh, we did something else and the design engineers came up with this torque that was beautiful, symmetric. No, we could do that using computers. So the, the, the gap between so-called creative and automated designs is again, closing down. Uh, in chess, people talk about, oh, what a creative player he is, right? Well, it's an algorithm. Musicians are considered very creative. They're still not there as yet to replace, you know, the great musicians with the computer. But my prediction is 10 years from now, that's gonna be completely different where computers are gonna beat any musician at that game. So the gap is closing. I, I know people hate me for saying that, but I don't think I, I don't think you can close anything against computers. It's just way too, I mean, again, we need to be proud of what we did. Computers are not enemies. Humans created them. So we need to be proud of what we did. It's just like we created something that created something else. So eventually it comes back as a feather in our cap. Um, okay, to add on to that question. Um, so now that the creative, creative and automation gap is closing, um, now automation can take more and more of the jobs that only humans could once do. So. Mm -hmm. Like what direction of jobs do you think will open up? Do you think like in the future, like 
everyone will be only focused on technology or do you think there will still like be jobs that are completely separate from the technology and like will not yeah. be by automation? No, that's a very good question because it says, well, if computers could do everything, what's my job? Maybe I don't need any job, right? Or maybe I won't get any job. That's not true. So part of the problem is suppose the right problem. Computers are garbage in, garbage out, right? If you don't pose the right problem, you won't get the right solution. So much of engineering headache is about posing the right problem to the computer. And that's not an easy task. So that's what I would say you as an engineer need to be good at is to understand, to translate what you see out there into a problem that a computer can understand and crunch. They're only crunching numbers. Technically, they're not solving any problem, right? They're only crunching numbers. You as an engineer, the one who's going to pose it as a problem. Remember I said the undergrad took two days to pose the problem, understand and pose the problem. The computer took a few minutes, but if you pose a wrong problem, it'll give you a wrong solution very fast, right? That you don't want that. So uh, Vanita, do you want to wrap up or? Yes, before I wrap up, but I have a question myself. Uh -oh. I think what will be trouble. very helpful for students to know is that um, one needs to have some level of computer knowledge, especially programming, in order to be able to do something more in their fields. So although you're a mechanical engineer, most of your work is primarily computational, right? right? It's not that, you know, it's not the traditional sense of mechanical engineering where you're sitting in a carpentry shop, a shop or a lathe shop. Like right. back, back in India, at least, first year of engineering, all of us spend time in the machine shop. Right. doing things that we normally will not do anymore. So that's one thing I wanted to point out that this is becoming a prerequisite to, to uh -huh. do well in many fields. The whole idea of understanding programming and knowing how to do computational things. I will totally agree with you hundred percent. I think it is pretty regarding to programming PLA uh, and it has paid off. And I realize now, and I emphasize to my kids, I said the number one thing you need to master is math. Right, I don't. I don't say memorize math. I understand the abstract nature of math. What does math trying to teach you? The first thing I would recommend that you master. After you master math, my next recommendation is to go programming. It it has so much a benefit in understanding concepts, abstracts. I'm not saying for a job you'll get this two hundred thousand dollar job. That's not my point. The point is the skill that you develop, the way of thinking, the abstract way of thinking. You'll sharpen it with computer skills. So I will. I'm hundred percent agree that even in the most applied nature of research work today, computers, you can't run away from them. You should not run away from them. You should embrace them and learn as many things about computers as possible. And as if you've already seen from uh, the timeline that Professor Suresh shared, one path is to go in the research track as a faculty. The other track is to go, you know, become, uh, you know, somebody who would be in the industry. So both of those tracks are equally applicable when you do engineering. So Today, we saw an instance of where he spoke primarily about what he did as a faculty or what he continues to do as a faculty member. But soon, we'll also have people who, are, who only are very specific to what they do in the industry, and they'll be talking to you more about what they do for a career. And you will notice that once you get into the industry, there are a lot of other soft skills that you, I mean, everybody needs it, even you know, academia, academician needed. But in the industry, you need a lot of things like project planning, you know, negotiation skills, a lot of other soft skills that you need to acquire to do well with your career. So we'll have more people from those fields also addressing you. But thank you again for being part of the session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Suresh and Pranav for moderating. Um, we look forward to having you in the future sessions. Uh, we'll have it every fortnight, so please stay tuned. And when you get a moment, go to our Facebook page, Sayat Services, and uh, put a comment or a note saying what you enjoyed about the session today. That would be very valuable for other people so that more people can benefit from it. Thank you again. This was a great uh, opportunity, uh, Suresh and Pranav and Vanita and the kids. You asked such good questions, very yes, deep questions, not very easy to answer. So, so nice and uh, to hear from all of you. So this is a great initiative. Um, thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Manita, for this opportunity. Thank you, Pranav. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. All the best for all of you. Thank you, Uncle. This uh, like really like uh, I, I I have I have a lot of questions, but that was really helpful. <laughs> I, Good I, for you. So one thing I wanted to tell you, I know several of you are actually very passionate about music. 
one great thing about being in academia is that you will have a very good source of income great way to keep your brain engaged and uh, more than engaged i would say because uh, there's always mm. things to do and you can pursue your music also on the side and not be too worried about what income you get from it uh, this is just something i'm telling you as somebody you know who is also a musician i teach music and i sing i also perform but i also have a full time job but academia is very very uh, unique in the sense that you have a lot more flexibility right you can say more about that suresh i mean i think it's important for people to know that yeah i think especially because i heard a lot of people talk about the interest in music and these days it becomes a challenge where would you spend time um I, somebody else had a question i'll answer that from warson just a second uh yeah i think faculty life i will not deny is the, one of the most wonderful i work in the industry too so i would not have had the right to speak if i did not work in the industry so i spent 5 years in the industry and then whatever 17 years in the university so i can tell the difference is that now i have the freedom to pursue i work 7 days a week it's not like i'm not working but i work when i want to work i can set aside some time for pursue my passions i do not have a boss to report to right that's very very important for me i want the freedom to think and uh, and the, the i can pursue my purpose in life uh within you know the the, the constraints so i would say faculty life is definitely a plus but do not rule out industry too because industry there are a lot of wonderful industrial jobs out there which will give you as much freedom as well uh so keep all your options open listen to other speakers as well mine is this one sided view of one one aspect of life so you should listen to everybody please chime in come in to other sessions uh and listen to what they say right and then you make a decision saying no this is better for me because my character best suits this kind of position because faculty life has its own challenges as well so uh some sorry one last question varshan i had a question about a uh, masters program so for example they has uh, what is the appropriate masters program for in uh, reliability or is that the question varshan i can check but i did not fully understand the question uh masters program to make programs in efficiency and other problems um so there's no general area you can choose engineering there's masters in statistics but that's a little bit mathematical so i would say if you're not sure almost any field in masters in engineering systems engineering is a good field for example where you don't need to specialize in a sub field and you get intro to statistics and look at efficiency and other things so i would say i don't know uh, you would be a good person to reach out to uh, to talk about systems engineering and what it has to offer so maybe you guys can connect with each other it doesn't have to be limited to us so you guys have a good network yeah that's that's one of the things i'm planning on creating a mentor network so pranav it'll be great if you can you know help answer questions and things like that sure thing yeah thank you we we'll planned it yep all right everybody take care thank you thank you bye bye everyone